And uh, you guys got to do better when you come to a church. You got to start bringing visitors. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin the service tonight. Brother Brian, would you have a word of prayer for us? Amen. You may be seated. Wanted to give you just a little update. Uh, Miss Carolyn is, is in the hospital, but Miss Tony was with her this afternoon, and she's doing okay. We've got some tests, I think, tomorrow, some biopsies and things, but uh, continue to pray. But she was in great spirits today. I know several of you have been asking, and uh, we praise the Lord for that. It's been a great day. Uh, I've been excited about what God has done already and uh, looking forward to tonight. If you have not filled out your faith promise, I encourage everyone to do so. And uh, make sure you uh, fill it out. If you have not done so or you have not turned it in, you can do so tonight. We'll hand these out just in a short little while. On Wednesday nights, the last few Wednesdays, we've been going over the top 50 most persecuted countries in our world. And every Wednesday night, we have a list of them, and we go over, and each one of us takes a country to pray for. And, of course, you know this list. I, I've said it several times, and I hope we're considering evangelism to our world. And that's what this weekend is kind of based on and focused on, and I'm looking forward to uh, round number two of Corinthians chapter 8. Looking forward to that this evening. What I'd like to do now, Brother Brian, would you come and lead us in Saved by the Blood? And then, um, then I'll dismiss after that uh, for handshaking and such. Okay. Page 663. 663. Think about the words as you sing this. So thankful for what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. Amen. Saved by the blood. 660 or 363. Yeah. I'm sorry, 363. Sorry about that. 363. Sing the first verse, then we'll shake hands and greet one another. Say by the blood of the crucified one, now ransom from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Son, say by the blood of the crucified one, say, say, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone, say, say, I'm saved by the Crucified one. This is what we're going to have, Brother Salvatier. Brother Hein, would you go back to your tables? And uh, Brother Snyder, I guess if you and your wife would go back as well. We're going to have handshaking time, but I want you to go back and talk with uh, these families and get to know them. I want most of our conversations in the back. We'll take an extended time, so don't feel rushed. Make sure you know them. Ask them questions. They'll be at their table. And listen, everybody needs to leave here with a prayer card for these families, and we need to pray for them, so make sure you pick one up. The piano is just going to play. Let's all stand. We'll greet one another and you go back and make sure you know their ministries.
as we make our way back to our seats. We're going to go ahead and sing this last verse, 363, on the last verse now. Say by the blood of the crucified one, all hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Say by the blood of the crucified one, save, save. seated. I'm usually the one he's waiting on to quit talking and get back up here. Um, what I'd like to do now, of course, with missions uh, weekend, it's been a great weekend. We had a great time last night, a great time of fellowship. It's been a great day today. God is blessed. And um, what I'd like to do one last time here is I'd like to have uh, both of our families come up in just a moment. And I've asked them to share something unique about the country or their ministry. And I've asked them to bring their spouse up. So would you, Brother Salvatierre, would you and your wife come on up here and just share something uh, uh, something unique about the ministry and um, just share it briefly if you would with us uh, t tonight well there's a lot of things you know it was like uniquely so it's a lot of things you, you might start thinking about it but before I say that I want to say one more time thank you church for all the kindness you showed to us and the accommodations and the food and all of that just being amazing so thank you for that and uh, something about uh, very unique in Bolivia is uh, the highest lake um, that you can navigate in, in a boat is in Bolivia. It's Lago Titicaca, the highest lake in the world is there. Also, the, the biggest uh, salt flat in Bolivia is in Bolivia also. It's a salt flat. So you can go literally, you can go for an hour at uh, 50 miles per hour in a, in, a, in a jeep and just go. It's a desert, just salt nothing else the only thing you can see is uh, just white everywhere so it's kind of uh, uh, interesting other thing that is very interesting about the food in Bolivia we eat uh, peanut soup how many of you probably say wow it's actually very good it's actually very good all right so uh, they have the peanuts right there they put it in the blender they blend the peanuts and then just put chicken inside and just cook it cook it out and they, they do it with fries so you fry fries, just put a french fries right there inside too, so it's just how it is, so it's very unique, right? Very unique. So, um, but uh, uh, other thing about, about Bolivia also, the northern and the southern part, the northern part is a, is a flat land, and the southern part of Bolivia is uh, a mountains, big, big mountains, so the northern part of Bolivia is the part of the Amazon, the southern part of Bolivia is part of the Andes. So it's kind of interesting, very drastic from one place to another because one place is very hot, the other one is very cold. So it's very, very interesting also. But our, our, as we, I mentioned already, we are excited about going to Bolivia and do what God has called us to do there in Bolivia. Would you share that animal you were talking to me about earlier I'd never heard of, but like the elephant trunk? Oh, it's uh, called uh, tapir. I don't know if you know a tapir. It, look, it, it, it grows about this big. It looks like an elephant. It's kind of like... Would you describe it a little bit more? It's kind of like a small version of an elephant with a little, a shorter snout, but um, almost like a trunk like an elephant, but it's shorter than an elephant's trunk. And just looks, it's like a miniature, almost like a little cow slash elephant. I don't know. They're kind of cute, but they're And different. we eat them. <laughs> yes. He's a good man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What do you call him, a tapir? Tapir. I have to look them up on the internet because I've never heard of one before. Brother Snyder, did you say you'd heard of them before, or was that new to you? Not till he's talking about that. You've heard of them, Brother Hine? Uh, you're strange, I guess. <laughs> Anyone else ever heard of that animal? Okay, okay. My own wife knows about it. Huh? Okay, maybe it's not as rare as I thought. All right, I don't know. Just put me on front street. No big deal. Miss Barbara has heard of them before. Wonderful. Do they taste good? What does it taste like? Like beef or? Like buffalo? There we go. We're all taking a trip to Bolivia. We'll come over there and help you start it. Brother and Mrs. Hine, would you folks come up here? They've been a, such a blessing and encouragement, and they 
Um, they have this big trailer. It's their trailer that's blocking your parking spots out there. So just be mad at them. Um, but anyway, God has really blessed them and using them in a mighty way. Um, I know he's given, told me about blessings of people excited about their ministry and getting behind it. Would you just share a couple things about that, you and your wife, if you would? All right. Um, again, uh, just thank you for having us. Um, I don't think there were any fires today, so that's an improvement from the last time we were here. Um, but uh, he asked us to share uh, just a little bit about the ministry. And I'm going to just, I think one of our, one of my favorite projects that we've done, and I shared, if you were here last night, uh, about our trip or my trip to Alaska. Um, and it was in the middle of COVID. It was October of 2020. I get a phone call from a pastor that we met in Africa that pastors in Seattle, Washington, that's planning a church in, in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, so it's just about who you know, I guess. But uh, uh, he called and said, hey, how busy are you right now? I said, I'm very busy, actually. We've got several meetings coming up. Um, he says, okay, what are you doing this week? I said, I've got meetings Sunday and Sunday. He says, okay, I'll fly you out on Monday and fly you back on Saturday out of Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, but uh, we got up there. And we were turning a bar that had closed down because of COVID into a church building. And to, uh, to go in there and you could see, you could see what it was. Um, and it was just, it smelled like a bar. It was just, it was, it was gross, okay? Um, but uh, to go in there and, and to completely gut everything, to refinish walls, add walls. We had the nursery and the Sunday school rooms. Uh, going on and then to uh, to leave the place uh, just about ready. I think we Isla had to leave a week before they opened up so they were still putting the flooring and stuff down but um, to know what that place was and what it represented in the community to what it is today and what it represents today in the community. I shared last night we, we would often, uh, pretty much every night we would go out to eat dinner after work, uh, after working there at the building and people would ask us, you know, why are you here? What are you guys doing? And we would, we would say the name of the bar. And I said, oh, yeah, we're, we're working over here. I don't remember the name now, but we're working over here at this, uh, uh, this bar. And they're like, oh, yeah, 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 I know where it is. I said, okay, we're turning it into a church. You still know where it is. All right, glad to know. Um, but uh, to know uh, that we had a part in that. And then I was uh, reading his prayer letter, the pastor that pastors of that church, on average is seeing 18 people saved a month through that ministry there. Um, and to know that we had just a small part of that. Uh, it was just a huge blessing. Um, don't forget to come and sign up on our iPad if you're interested in going on a trip. And my wife's going to share real quick about a trip as well. So something from my um, point of view, kind of, we went to Japan, and we'll also go to Oklahoma or wherever. But people need to sleep and eat and be in And so that's kind of the logistical side of things that I take care of. Um, that we went on, he mentioned the other day, my third child was eight weeks old when we were there. And so we would, we knew this, the size of people. And so we had, we made a grocery list and we would have to go to their like Sam's club and get the foods. And in Japan and in France, it looks like the So you have to just like look at all the packaging and see if you can figure out what the stuff is. Um, and in France, we were on our own trying to figure it out. But in Japan, then I worked with that missionary's wife. And so she helped um, translate what she knew, what the stuff was. And so that um, is how we created the tables. And if, we, if there was nothing we could do at the time on that particular day of the project, then we would take the kids, and there was a park, like you could just see from the church. And so my kids would play on the park. Well, they can play with Japanese kids just like they can here. They don't know them either way. And especially at that time, no one really knows what kids are saying. So it didn't matter <laughs> the language barrier. They didn't care. Everybody knows tag. And so then it gave, obviously, I'm not Japanese. And so I stick out. And it was easy for them us to talk about, oh, why are you here? And then from there, like he said, here there's a sign. But there they just had a sign over there like from the park you could point this building right here is the the church and then that's the bible college that we're working on the thing for us to do is just play with the people just being normal and just literally point them to christ just right down the road um, so it was just neat and then to think that even in the states we can do the same thing you can go to the parks and you could just be a normal family at the park and 
just talk to the other moms while your kids are playing or whatever they do at the park. Um, that's kind of what I do and whatever he says. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And also on top of that, you, you homeschool your children as well, correct? Most yes. Most, most of them. Yes, the little baby's not in school yet. Uh, Brother Snyder, would you, would you and your wife come up? I didn't ask you about this. Would you share what you do? What does BIMI do? Would you just share that with us um, as you oversee that and what you do for missionaries? Would you just explain the board and uh, maybe a couple of your duties? Would you just share that with us tonight? Sure. Um, trying to narrow that down into a small capsule of what we do. Basically, we have 7,000 independent Baptist churches that give through BIMI to 800 missionaries serving in 100 different fields of the world. That keeps us very busy. Um, there's always something that goes on with the logistics of that. We're responsible for every dime that comes through. So the accountability and the accounting of all the monies, IRS obviously requires certain receipting to be done, so we send the receipts and all the things that are involved with that. At the end of the month, every missionary gets a statement that shows how many churches gave and what they gave. There's also interaction with churches and helping out missionaries with deputation, with furlough, getting in and out of countries, the paperwork that's involved with getting them in and out. There's international insurance. Uh, a lot of those things are involved. To sum it up, I will say that if you want to see a little video about that, if you go to BIMI.org, we have a what we call home office video that kind of tells and explains all the things that I said, but it says it a whole lot nicer and has a whole bunch of pictures, okay? I'm, I'm a picture guy, so uh, you can check that out. My wife is the first lady of BIMI. Um, <laughs> she is also the decorator and the coordinator for everything as far as the big get-togethers and the things that we have. Would you like to say it? <laughs> She's nervous. Sorry. No, Go ahead. No, it's fine. Um, so anytime we have like candidate school or anything that goes on where we have meals, then I am the one that um, kind of helps orchestrate that and puts the tablecloths on the tables and, you know, there's the things behind the scenes that need to be done. And like you said, we, the Lord, um, different people have passed away and left some money to be, I might to be used specifically at our facilities. And so there were some things that just needed to be updated and all of that. So um, just behind the scenes, just being able to coordinate those kind of things. And I just love it and enjoy it very much. So that's kind of what I do. So. And then she has to account for me, too. So that's the full-time <laughs> job. Amen. Thank you. Perfect. I appreciate it. So many of our missionaries, I think, I think all of them go through a board of some sort. We have different boards and uh, around the country, so the money will go through the board to the missionary. And so there's a lot of responsibility on their behalf, and we praise the Lord. And now he won't—he hasn't said this yet, but he does raise support. Nobody pays him. He raises support just like other people do. Him and his wife—they—they um, they raise support to oversee that. And uh, just servants of God, and we praise the Lord for them being with us and being our speaker, and uh, just a blessing. What we'll do now is um, we'll take up our offering tonight, uh, Brother Dallas, Brother Sean. If you folks would come up, Quest, why don't you come up? We'll, we'll sing our special for the offertory here. Um, we'll do that, and then we'll get Brother Snyder up here. If you have not received um, a missionary uh, a faith promise giving card, uh, Brother Kevin has them. If you just raise your hand, Brother Kevin, if you just stand up. Um, if anybody needs one, has not received one, would like one, uh, just raise your hand. Um, if anybody needs one, uh, he want, we want to make sure you get them. If not, that, that's fine. If you have not filled yours out from this morning, you can put that in the offering plate. Uh, Brother Sean, would you ask God to bless the offering? Timeless theme, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream, God will make all things new that day. Gone is the curse from which I stumbled and fell. 
evil is vanished to eternal hell. No more night, no more pain, no more tears ever crying again. And praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of the risen land. See all around, now the nations bow down to sing. The only sound is the praises to Christ our King. Slowly the names from the book are read. I know the King, so there's no need to dread. No more night, no tears never crying again and praises to the great i am we will live in the light of the risen lamb see over there there's a mansion prepared for me where i will live with my Savior eternally. No more night, no more pain, no more tears, never crying again, and praises to the great I am. We will Amen. Yes, we praise the Lord. No more night one day. Amen. No more darkness, no more pain. Looking forward to that day. If you would, grab your Bibles. It's been a great day. Get your Bibles open. And uh, Brother Schneider, if you'd come up and preach for us, thank you for being with us this weekend and your heart for the Lord and for worldwide evangelism. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. All right, thank you. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord tonight. Second Corinthians chapter number 8. We're going to pick up where we left off in just a minute. Let me give you a quick uh, advertisement, if I could. On the back table, we've got information for all over the world, different fields of the world, but a couple things that I'd like to at least uh, draw your attention to. Conversations on the commission. Those of you who like podcasts, we've got a lot of podcasts that you can listen about missions, um, anything and everything really about missions, things that you've thought about and know about concerning missions and things that you maybe haven't ever thought about concerning missions. And so if you're a podcast kind of person, pick one of those up and check that out. Also the BIMI World Magazines on the back. Uh, a lot of times folks will say to me, well, or is there a charge for those? Or, you know, that's a magazine. And yes, uh, normally uh, I, I, they're free tonight. They're half that cost. Okay. So that is a sale that you cannot beat. Please take them with you because I would like to lighten my load. I'd love it if everybody would take one as long as you're going to read it. Don't use it for fire starter. Okay. But if you're going to read it, and I think it will be a blessing to you. This one really focuses on the discipleship aspect of the great commission. Cause when we lead somebody to Christ, that's really when the work starts. Okay. And this is uh, talking all about discipleship, not only one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, also uh, Bible colleges, Bible institutes, around the world and what some of the missionaries are doing with all of that. And then one other thing I'll mention to you, uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier as far as our responsibilities, along with being the president and general director for BIMI, I am also the director for Camp Bimmy. I decided I didn't have enough to do as the general director that I wanted to add another minute. No, I'm just kidding. This is somewhat temporary. This is going to be our third year that I'm doing this. But if you have an interest in missions, if you're 16 years of age or older, and you have an interest in missions, wondering, hey, could God be calling me to missions? Or what is missions all about? What does it really entail? 
This is a week-long camp that tells you the answers to those questions. It is held on the campus of BIMI, and we call it a missionary boot camp. It is a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. Uh, there are college-level classes that we teach throughout the week, and um, a lot of activities that um, all about learning about yourself and others and missions and how all of that ties in. Every meal is an international meal, so we haven't gotten to the point where we're serving you know anything he talked about tonight but we do serve some things that you probably have never heard of but you will enjoy it if you come okay um, but it teaches you how to you know broaden your palate and if somebody offers you some food in another culture or another place you don't just automatically turn up your nose and ooh, I don't like that you have never tried it, okay? Now, some things you got to be careful about even trying in some cultures because you can get really sick. But we talk about that too. Listen, if, if you might would be interested in this, please, or you know someone who else who might be, pick one of these up and take them with you. Take it with you and either pass it on to them or read about it. Pray about Camp Bimmy as a possibility. You know, it's not just for young people, by the way. This past summer, we had somebody there that was 65 years of age. Okay, so I'd like to beat that record. If you're over 65 and interested, let me know, okay? Um, but it's not just for single folks, it's for married. We even give a discount for married couples. And um, in case you're wondering, the, uh, the Hines were there as a married couple, and they survived. They're still here to tell you about Camp Bimmy. So if you want to see somebody that has survived it, Caleb has been through Camp Bimmy as well, so he can tell you about it. Don't tell him not to ask. Don't ask about this part of Camp Bimmy. Just ask about the rest of it. But no, it's, it is, I think, a, a great, great place to go to learn about missions. So pick up one of those and take them with you as well. Thank you, church for having us here this weekend. You have been just amazingly kind to us, putting us in a great place to stay and the food and just the fellowship, the hospitality has been wonderful. Thank you. And I'm excited for you as a church. I am looking ahead to the future for what God has for you when it comes to missions and, and in giving to missions. And as you follow the biblical principles that God gives in his word when it comes to faith promise giving or grace giving. And I want to pick up where I left off this morning and tonight's message you'll see is just a little bit more, if you, if you will, on the practical side of grace giving. Why do we do what we do? Uh, what are the biblical principles behind some of the things that we do with faith promise giving? So I want to ask for the Lord's help and then we'll do just a quick review and jump into uh, this, this uh, message for tonight. Lord, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, thank you for this weekend, the emphasis that this church has placed on the Great Commission. Lord, I know that you will bless them for that, but I also know that Satan will fight. And so, Lord, help them to stay strong and help each one individually to remain faithful to the commitments that you've laid on their hearts. Lord, help this church to do more for missions in the future than they have ever done before. Again, now I ask for your help. And I ask for the filling of your Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, make this an eternally profitable time. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 2 Corinthians 8, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, we do to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Paul says we're going to make known to you God's grace. Not just his saving grace or sustaining grace, but a special grace, the grace of giving that was bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, despite, verse number two, the great trial of affliction that they were in and the deep poverty that they were enduring, there was a joy, joy not only in the midst of the trial, but joy in giving. And the Bible says that all of this abounded under the riches of their liberality. Very simply, God blessed them for their giving. Not necessarily monetarily, because the Bible says they were still in deep poverty, but for sure, God blessed them in eternity. And I believe even now, they are enjoying the blessings that God bestowed upon them in eternity. They gave, verse number three, to their power. They gave what they could. But I believe that as they experienced the grace of God in giving. They said, God, would you allow us to give more? God, would you allow us to give even beyond what we can give? And God answered that prayer. And the Bible says they gave not only to their power, but beyond their power. 
And the key to that we talked about this morning was that they were willing of themselves. They wanted to do it. And that's where we had the little lesson, gentlemen, about how to and how not to give flowers to your wife. Okay? We don't give them because we have to. And if we do, our wives are going to say, keep them. We don't want them. Hey, if we give an offering because we have to, God says keep it. By the way, this is grace giving, not guilt giving. Okay? And it's not that we have to give, it's that we get to give. And there's a big difference between those two. And see, the churches at Macedonia said, God, we get to give. This is an amazing thing. We love experiencing your grace. And so much so, verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we'd receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They said, Paul, please take this offering. And we talked about in verse 4 how this was an offering for others, an offering that was given to a missionary used for the purpose of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and establishing the church particularly there in Jerusalem, and then the importance of giving God his tithe first. And then over and above God's tithe, the faith promise offering. And this they did, verse 5, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. The key the key verse in all the verses that we're looking at is right here, giving ourselves first to the Lord. And also giving ourselves to our local church and the, if you will, missions program and the missions giving of the local church so that God can use each one individually, but then God can use corporately this local church to do more for missions than you might ever think because God is the God of the impossible. And it's amazing to see him at work. So that brings us to where we pick up for tonight. Verse number six, insomuch that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Now, Titus had begun this. He had some role in this offering. We're not sure exactly what that role was. But notice that God says here, so he would finish, uh, also finish in you the same grace also. What grace is he going to finish? He's talking Talking about the offering, the grace of giving. As the church at Corinth had started in that, they were excited about it, they wanted to do it. Now it was time to finish that, follow through with what they said that they were going to do. Therefore, verse number seven, as ye abound in everything, in faith, and utterance, and knowledge, and all diligence, and in your love to us, he said, See that ye abound in this grace or this gift also. Now notice here that Paul gives the church at Corinth five compliments. And that's not an easy thing to do for the church at Corinth because they were a carnal church. But he said, listen, you're abounding in faith and in utterance and in knowledge and in diligence and your love to us. And he says, that's a good thing. Continue in that. But he says, now see that ye abound in this grace also. And for you and I, I believe the application here is this. Those things that we are abounding in, particularly within our local church, whether it's a Sunday school class we're involved in, junior church, picking up folks, bringing them to church, whatever that is, continue and abound in those things. That's how you reach your Jerusalem. But we're supposed to go beyond just our Jerusalem to our Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so that's why Paul says, see that ye abound in this grace also. So church, continue to abound in the things that you're doing here through this local church, but see that ye abound in this grace also. Because this gives you the opportunity to see souls saved, not just here in this area, but around the world. But I also want you to see there, Paul says, see that ye abound in this grace also. In other words, don't just tip God. This offering isn't about just having a few coins left over at the end of the week and say, yeah, I'll give that to missions. That'll be my faith promise. No, see that ye abound in this grace also. Now, you've noticed that I like to go down through Scripture verse by verse and phrase by phrase, and I want to go on record that I did not skip verse number 8. Okay? It's an important verse. Here's what Paul says. He says, I speak not by commandment. What does that mean? Very simply this, you don't have to do it. Notice, by the way, that is a difference between God's tithe and this offering. God's tithe is God's tithe. We're just simply commanded to give it. This is an offering, 
and there is not a command associated with this offering. Now, before we let out any kind of sigh of relief, like I said, I want to read the whole verse. Paul says this, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. Paul says you don't have to be involved in this offering, but before you make that decision to not be involved, he said there's two things you need to think about. Number one, the occasion of the forwardness of others. What's he talking about? The example of others. Who's that? The churches at Macedonia. And he's saying, hey, church at Corinth, hey, you're not in a great trial affliction. You're not in deep poverty. You're not even fighting those things. Look what God did in Macedonia. And don't you want God to do that same thing here for you? He says, stop and think about the example that they have set for you. But also he says this, number two, he says, you don't have to be involved, but stop and think about the fact that this offering will prove the sincerity of your love. If I were to go around the auditorium tonight and I were to ask each one of you, do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? Do you love the Lord? Do you? I would assume that everybody would say yes. I mean, verbally, yes, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. And that's a good thing, but we need to go beyond saying it with our mouth. We need to go to living it with our lives and giving to prove the sincerity of our love. Why is this so important? Well, we can give without loving, but we cannot love without giving. Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our treasure and our heart, they're inseparably linked. Think about this tonight and do this little test in your mind. Generally speaking, the things that we love the most are the things that we will spend the most money on. And generally speaking, the things that we love the least are the things that we'll spend the least or spend nothing on because we really don't care about those things. So in your mind, as you go down through your bank account, you go down through the bills that you have each month, what is it that you spend the most money on? Then what is the second thing that you spend the, the second most money on? And then the third, then the fourth. And as you make that list, here's the question that I come to. Where's God in that list? What is it that we really love? Who is it that we really love? You know, we don't have to give. But you know what? I would not want to miss out on an opportunity to not just say with my mouth, but to prove with my actions, Lord, I love you. You know, if, if I constantly said to my wife, sweetheart, I love you. I love you. I, I really do love you. I love you. But I've never provided for her, never gave her food that she needed, never gave her transportation, never put a roof over her head, you know, the clothing that she needed, etc. You know, at some point in time, probably sooner rather than later, she would come to me and say, listen, bud, we've got to have a meeting. <laughs> you, know, you know, you're saying this with your mouth, but you're not living it with your life. Your actions are not proving what your mouth is saying. I wonder how often God wants to say to us, hey, you know what, it's time to have a little meeting here. <laughs> I hear you saying with your mouth, I love you, but I'm not really seeing it with your actions. But what an amazing opportunity you and I have to prove the sincerity of our love. We don't have to be involved. But boy, I'll tell you, I would not want to miss out on this opportunity to show God how much I love him. You know, one of the little illustrations that I've thought of over the years, as United States citizens, we don't have to go to the voting booth and vote. It's not required. But you know what? As a U.S. citizen, I would not want to miss out on that privilege of being able to go and voice my opinion, if you will, as to who should next be in office. Hey, as Christians, we don't have to be involved. But I would never want to miss out on the privilege of giving so that others can go and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. Now, if that's not enough for us, just in case, I think that's why Paul put verse number 9 in. He says in verse number 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Notice the words that Paul uses here. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I remind you that the ultimate example of grace giving is Jesus Christ himself. 
He gave himself. He left heaven to come to this earth. Why? So that, you know, hey, he could promote himself and he could make himself rich. No, no, no. It was for our sakes. He made himself poor so that we could be rich. What an amazing example Jesus Christ sets for us. And as we give, let's remember the example of Jesus Christ. So this brings Paul to verse number 10. He says, and herein I give my advice. So we know he's a good preacher. He's given some godly advice here. He says, for this is expedient for you. Now put it in his context. Remember what he's saying here. This is expedient for you. Who's he writing to? The church at Corinth. We understand, I hope, that this is expedient for the missionary. It makes sense. Because as you give, this goes to the missionary. And it's expedient for them. Because when they go to the grocery store, they can buy groceries. That's kind of important. You know, I like groceries. I really do. All right? So it's expedient for the missionary. We get that. But that's not what Paul is saying right here. He said, this is expedient for you. Who's that? Those who give towards this offering. It's expedient for us, those of us who get involved in faith, promise giving, or grace giving. How so? Well, quite literally, I think I have about 11 things written down here that is a sermon all by itself. And pastor said we had to be out before midnight. So I'm not going to go there, okay? But I am going to mention two things really quick. Number one. This is a way to exercise our faith on a regular basis. And we need to exercise our faith. That's the only way our faith is going to grow and become stronger. And, and by the way, you've heard the, uh, the saying, no pain, no gain. There's some pain involved here. It stretches us, but it grows us as well. This is expedient for us. But also, here's another thing. This is an opportunity to lay up treasure in heaven for all eternity. You know, I don't know if you've ever looked at it this way or not, but this is kind of like a deposit ticket for the bank of heaven. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on up ahead. It's a pretty amazing deal too, by the way. You know, I remember when I was younger, um, you know, you would put something in the bank and, and you would get this thing back called interest. Some of you remember those days? Okay. Now you put something in a bank and you get this thing called a service charge. Okay. So things have changed. But you know what? There is no service charge in the bank of heaven. There is interest. And the interest rate, I'm sorry for the pun, but it is out of this world. It is for all eternity. And when we lay up treasure in heaven, we don't have to worry about the moth getting in there. It's never going to rust. There's no thieves that are going to get through. It's never going to burn up. It is for all eternity. Amen. What an amazing investment opportunity God is giving us right here. This is expedient for us. But we move on. Here and I give my advice, for this is expedient for you who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. What's he saying? Well, who have begun before, that was you were ready to give this offering a year prior, not only to do, but also to be forward. That is, you were resolved, you were determined, purposed, you were excited about being part of this. And then he says, a year ago. Now, those... Three words a year ago, we could just kind of read over them and move on. But look, I just want to stop for a moment because I said this is a practical message. There's at least two principles that I want you to see here tonight when we read those words a year ago. Number one is this. I believe that we have here the principle for the annual Faith Promise Missions Conference. Now, is everybody listening? If you fell asleep, this is time to wake up, okay? Okay. Don't leave here and say that the preacher said that the Bible says thou shalt have an annual faith promise missions conference. Okay, because I'm not saying that that's what the Bible says. But I am saying the principle is here for an annual faith promise missions conference. Here's why I believe that. Under inspiration, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes to the church at Corinth one year after having been there. One year after they made the promise, the commitment to be part of this offering. And he's doing two things. Number one, he's saying, church at Corinth, I want you to think back to one year ago. And I want you to consider the promise you made to be part of this offering. And I want you to consider what has happened over the past year. By the way, is that not what we're doing here? <laughs> 
Think back to a year ago and a promise that you made, a commitment you made to give. And dare I say that if you've been faithful to give over the past year, probably we could have a great testimony service here of how God was very, very good because God is always good. Yeah. And perhaps you might say, well, I'm kind of more like the Corinthians. I was excited, but I didn't follow through. Hey, here we get to that reminder because not only are we saying look back to a year ago, but now we're also saying look to the future. And what will you do? Because that's what Paul's writing to the church at Corinth about. Hey, maybe you didn't follow through, but what will you do from this point forward? And again, that's the second part of the challenge of this particular conference, this Mission Sunday, this Missions Weekend that we're doing here. Not only look back to a year ago and what God has done over last year, but now look to the future. What will you do? What will that commitment be that you are going to make? And dare I say that as you consider the world in which we live and all the things that are going on around us, and boy, I, I just I see what's happening in the world, and I just say the Lord's coming is so soon. It might be in this next missions year. The need is greater now than it was one year ago. How can we give less now than what we gave a year ago? So... I believe the annual Faith Promise Missions Conference, I believe the principle is there for it. But there's a second thing I think I see here, and, and again, this is just being very practical. The commitment that you're making is a commitment for one year. Pastor mentioned this this morning. And this is important to understand because if you're like me, I want to know what I'm getting into. And, and you might say, well, why are you asking for a one-year commitment? Well, here's the principle. And by the way, aren't you glad that the church isn't asking for a 10-year commitment? You know, hey, this is practical. It works pretty good. I've been doing it for 32 years. Praise the Lord. But again, the principle is here for this. So when we're talking about a one-year commitment, here's some things to remember. Let's say that three or four months from now, some very financial difficulties come your way. Does that mean that after three or four months when those difficulties come that, well, you know, God knew they were going to come, so we're off the hook? No, no, no. This is a commitment for one year. So when those financial difficulties come in three or four months, you know what that's called? That's called a test. Sent by the Lord. Allowed by the Lord. How serious are you about this commitment that you're making? It is a serious commitment that you're making to God for one full year. Now, I've already talked to Pastor about this. He said I can present this, but only in a hypothetical way. So this is purely hypothetical, okay? But let's say that six months from now, you have a job transfer that takes you to some other state. Now, that, hypothetical, so you're not going to leave here, okay? But let's just say that happens. Six months from now, what does that mean? Does that mean you stop giving that faith promise commitment you made to missions here? No, no, no. It is a commitment for one full year. So hypothetically, when you make that move, by the way, the tithe does begin right away in that new church that God takes you to, but you finish out the last six months of that commitment and send that offering back here for six more times to follow through with that one-year commitment that you made. You say, what happens after that? Then hopefully you're then going to get right involved in the missions program of that new church where you're going. So why is that so important? Here's why it's important. This is a commitment that you're making to God. By the way, not to pastor, not to me, not even to the missionaries. You're making this commitment to God through, number two, this local church for one year. It's practical, it's plain. If you're like me, hey, I want to know what I'm getting involved in. So, this is, I believe, the biblical principle, where this comes from and why we do some of the things that we do. I need to hurry on. Verse number 11. Now, therefore, in other words, Paul says, considering all these things that we've talked about, now, therefore, perform the doing of it. He says, it's time to put your money where your mouth is. Let's, mouth is, let's follow through with this. Notice he says, as there was a readiness to will, in other words, you wanted to do it, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. And this is a really important part of faith promise giving, a performance out of that which we have. In other words, we don't wait for God to give it to us first and then we give it. We give it by faith. 
There are some who teach and preach faith promise this way. They say, listen, you just get a hold of one of these cards, you put a number on there, and whatever that number is, you just trust God for it. And if God gives it to you, praise the Lord, then you drop it in the offering plate. But if God doesn't give it, hey, you're off the hook. By the way, I preached a missions conference years ago in West Virginia, and I preached it just this way. And a pastor came to me when we were finished, and he said, Brother Snyder, you know, I've had other preachers in here for the last 14 years, and they've all presented faith promise and said, hey, if God gives it to you, then you give it. If God doesn't give it to you, you're off the hook. And he said, you know what? I've never been able to figure out why for the last 14 years, faith promise has never worked in our church. It's because we have to give it God's way. There's to be a performance out of that which we have. Trusting God for it. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38 for me. Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38. I've walked away from my Bible and I tell people my memory is good, it's just short. So I want you to check me, okay? Luke chapter 6 and verse number 38. When you get there, if you have a red letter edition, you're going to see this is Jesus and the context is giving. Luke chapter 6. Verse number 38, all right? So if I, if I don't quote this right, you stop me, all right? Ready? Here we go. After God gives it to you, then... Okay, some of you are catching it. Some of you are looking, what in the world is he saying? It's not what it says, is it? What's the first word? Give. Oh, that's where it starts. Huh. Give, and it shall be given unto you. How? Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. By the way, you know what that means in the Greek? It means you can't outgive God no matter how hard you try. But you have to give it God's way. Okay? There's a practical aspect to this. And again, I just want to be very practical. Give you two, give the, the, this testimony from our lives. We get a statement once a month from BIMI, the churches who gave to us. So when we get that statement, we get that check. The first thing that comes out of that check is God's tithe. It's just a math thing. You don't have to break out the calculator. And by the way, you might have to too, and that's okay. And by the way, God doesn't mind if you round it up. He, he's okay with that, okay? But give God his tithe. That's the first thing that comes out of our check. The second thing that comes out of our check is our faith, promise, commitment to missions. Why? Because there's to be a performance out of that which we have. God's already laid it on our hearts. We know this is what God told us to do. We've made the commitment, so we go ahead and give it out of that which we have. You say, what do you do after that, preacher? We pray a lot. But can I again say to you, God has been more than good to us. He's met every need and many of our wants as well. There's never been a bill that's gone unpaid, and they've all been paid on time. Listen, if we only gave this when we saw it first... Why would we call it faith promise giving? That would be called sight promise giving. And we're not to live or give by sight, but by faith. And by the way, why would we call it grace giving? And why would God go to all this, this time and to give us this passage of scripture all about grace giving? You don't need grace to give it if you see it first. You need grace to give it when you don't necessarily see it and you give out of that which you have and then say, God, you got to take care of the rest and then watch him be good to his promise. A performance out of that which we have. I'm going to end with verse number 12. He says, for if there be first a willing mind, and we've really already covered that, not doing it because we have to, but willingly giving, not grudgingly or of necessity. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted. In other words, God's view or God's acceptance of our gift. It is accepted according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. This might be my favorite part of grace giving. You say, why? Watch this. It's accepted. God's acceptance is about what we have, not what we don't have. God says, what's in your hand? You know, you and I, we, we get so worried about what we don't have. God says, I just want you to look at what I've given you, what you do have. And it's God's acceptance of our gift that matters, not man's acceptance of our gift. Yeah. Let me illustrate that to you. Over here, we have somebody that has a $50 faith promise offering. Woo, praise the Lord. That's good. We love it. Over here, we have somebody that has a $100 faith promise offering. Woo, the math they taught me in school is that this one is twice what that one is. But that's man's acceptance. 
and man's understanding. Because you see, this $50 faith promise offering was given out of a $500 budget. Whereas this $100 offering over here was given out of a $10,000 budget. Do you see what just happened? We realize this is not really the larger offering. This one is much larger. Because it's not the portion, it's the proportion. And by the way, this is backed up by Scripture. Jesus Christ himself, remember he's sitting in the temple in uh, Mark chapter number 12. And he's there with his disciples. And many are coming through. Some of them are rich. And boy, they're putting a lot in the offering plate. And by the way, Jesus didn't say that was a bad thing. Praise the Lord. But it's interesting because it's when the widow comes and she puts the two mites in the offering. That's when Jesus says to his disciples, okay, fellas, come here. You've got a lesson to learn right now. She has given more than all the rest. It's God's acceptance of the gift, not man's acceptance that counts. Here's what that tells me. We can, and I believe we all should, be involved in faith promise giving. No, it's not a command. I go back to verse 8. But I truly believe we can and we should. You say, well, Brother Snyder, listen, I, I, don't, I can't give much. It's not about the amount. It's about the obedience. Are we willing to just say to the Lord, Lord, this is what you want? I'm going to do it. And if God says, I want you to give a nickel a week, you know what you're supposed to give? A nickel a week. That's pretty simple. I can't get past simple, okay? But, you know, I, I, I would imagine that when the lad gave Jesus the five loaves and the two small fishes, he probably says, well, I don't have much to give. And Jesus said, just see what I can do with it. Just give it. So here's my thing. I remember as a missionary pastor, what I was really, I wasn't concerned about the big commitments that were given. What I looked at is if I saw 15 people in the auditorium and the cards came in and I had 15 cards in my hand, that was what rejoiced my heart. Because everybody said, you know what, we're just going to do what God tells us to do and we're going to be involved and we're going to do more for missions than we've ever done before. By the way, parents, teach your young people to give. I mean teach them to give. Teach them the principle of God's tithe. Lay it out to them. Help them to understand it belongs to the Lord. And then, by the way, teach them to give to faith promise missions. They may not understand a lot. And their, their commitment may be a nickel a week. It may be a nickel a month. But you know what? If they're giving when they're this tall, when they get to be this tall, giving will be second nature to them. And you know, I, I will say this, <laughs> tongue in cheek, if you have a young person, help them with this. Because childlike faith says, hey, $1,000 a week, I'm going to do it. You might be responsible for that as a parent, so be careful, all right? Help your young people. Sit down with them. Explain to them what this is and help them to put one in so that they can start giving even when they're this tall. The bottom line is, are we ready to take action? Are we ready to perform the doing of it? As a church, you understand that's right where you are. Here you are, closing out a missions year, ready to begin a new one. And the challenge of this weekend has been this, obey the Lord. Prove the sincerity of your love. Not anything you have to do, but boy, an opportunity I would never want to miss out on. Because this could very well be the year that the Lord returns. He might even return tonight. If he does, is the amount you put on this card the one he put in your heart? Will you be able to stand before him and hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. What an amazing example the churches of Macedonia are for you and I. Let's go from this place and follow their example. Would you stand with me, heads bowed and eyes closed? And I just want you to, again, take a few moments and consider the example that's been set for us in Scripture that God has given to us through the Apostle Paul as he writes about these churches in Macedonia. Would you pray about perhaps that commitment that God's been speaking to you about? I don't know what that amount is. Perhaps you've already put it in. Maybe you just put it in and didn't put on there all that God told you to put. I have no idea. Maybe you haven't done it yet, but you're looking to do it in the future. Take that time. Pray about it. Say, God, what is it that you would have me to give? But not only financially. How about prayerfully? 
taking on some missionaries to pray for them specifically, to pray for different things that you know that are going on around the world, to pray for more laborers. Perhaps it's to go. Maybe God's calling somebody here into full-time missionary service somewhere in the world. Or as we've already said, perhaps to go across the street and to speak to someone about Jesus Christ. If you want to take some time to come to the front and pray, we invite you to do that. We don't need music for that to happen. If God's spoken to you in a special way, we invite you. Would you come? Would you talk with the Lord? But at the very least, right there where you stand, would you pray and say, God, I want to do your will. God, help me to have the right attitude about giving. Lord, I'm available to do whatever it is you want me to do. And then say this, Lord, help me take action and follow through. Let's not be like the church in Corinth and be excited about it but never follow through. Starting strong is good, but finishing strong is even better. Ask God to help us, help us all to not only do his will, but to finish his will. In just a few moments, pastor will come and he'll close out this time of invitation. But until he does, would you take these next few moments and just pray and talk with the Lord. But I would keep in touch with those we already support, and I would take prayer cards and pray. God, I just pray that my life would be consumed with the gospel message, not only here, but God, around this universe that you've created. God, we love you, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you be seated just briefly? I want to share this. Um, um, just a couple things we have coming up. I was not able to give the announcements. I'd like to do that very briefly. Um, but just a thought on that. Um, my parents taught me when I was little, we, every time we got paid, we worked jobs, and they always told me, you save some, you give some, and then you invest in worldwide evangelism. And I'll tell you what, that made an impact ever since I first time I gave, I think I stole some pennies out of my dad's change thing, and uh, we put it in the offering, and uh, they found out later, they knew, so I stole money to give to missions. Um, so forgive me, I don't, know if that's, uh, I don't know if that's what you were talking about tonight. I gave willingly, but uh, my dad had a change drawer, and anyway, we, we took it. Anyway, so if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. So um, that is not a good way to end missions conference. <laughs> Um, but definitely give and uh, be faithful. Uh, Mission uh, Ladies Conference is coming weekend. Ladies will be heading to Hammond, Indiana. Several ladies are headed up there for the Ladies Conference. Be praying for that. Next Sunday, we have Ice Cream Sunday. This Saturday, I need some more people to come out. We're going to go at 11 o'clock. We're going to go to our apartment complexes in the area, and we're going to try to fill our van with young people coming to church. So we're going to knock on these apartments around us and invite them out for Ice Cream Sunday, 11 o'clock this week. Also, we have Easter Sunday coming up. So we're going to put door hangers on doors. So we have a lot to do. Um, and if several of you could come out this Saturday and the following Saturday to really invite folks. Uh, I also need candy uh, for our Easter Sunday. We're going to have an Easter egg hunt. And I need candy uh, for that. So if you'd like to start bringing that in, I know some have asked. Uh, about that and I hope you'll take part in that. A business meeting will be held on April 24th and April 17th we will have communion. Uh, Sean would you stand in the back? We're going to take up a love offering uh, for our families here that have come. They are going to be taking down their tables. I don't know if uh, Brother High if you guys are headed back tonight or not. I, I think I heard you might be. So they're going to want to get out of here pretty quickly tonight. So uh, make sure uh, we you, you tell them uh, thank you for coming on their way out. If you'd like to give some this money will go directly to 
to them, and Brother Sean will be standing at the back. Let's have a word of prayer, and we will be dismissed. Brother Houston, would you stand and ask God to bless the rest of our evening, if you would?